Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's wellness seminar entitled Inner Climate, Outer Climate, featuring our guest, Pascal Goswami. I would like to start by acknowledging that we are on the traditional and unceded territory of the Anishinaabeg Algonquin Nation, and I invite you to consider and learn about the history of the traditional territories from which you are attending today's webcast. Please note that you can experience today's session in the language of your choice, as well as in its original spoken language by selecting the floor option. Je m'appelle Jean-Manuel Bock. My name is Jean-Manuel Bock, and I will be your host for this session. Our guest, Bhaskar Goswani, is uh, a master yoga and meditation instructor and uh, a wellness speaker. He has created a number of wellness programs in more than 50 companies, including Bombardier, CBC, and Hydro-Québec. And he's joining us today to help us to make the connection between our internal climate, our physical, mental, and emotional uh, situation, and our external climate. A short question and answer period will follow towards the end of the session. You can submit your question to Bhaskar using uh, the button that uh, is provided at the bottom of your screen. And we intend to share the recording of this uh, with uh, everyone who is not able to attend. Bring a smile to your faces, settle into a peaceful state, as I invite our guest, Mr. Pascal Goswami, to join us. Pascal, the floor is yours. Merci, Jean-Emmanuel. I appreciate so much. I'm so happy to be here with you all, and uh, thank you, Environment and Climate Change Canada, for inviting me. Before we begin our journey, I'd invite us all to take five or so deep breaths just to really settle in our inner climate. We all might be arriving in different states. Some of us might be excited or distracted or maybe a little anxious or, or frustrated. Whatever the case may be, just take a moment to just settle in if you wish to. You can close your eyes. If you want to also experience it in, in a particular way, you can inhale through the nose, exhale through the mouth. You can also invite in an incantation, inhaling, I see this body, exhaling, I relax this body. So at your own speed and range, five or so deep breaths, just to really settle in. Inhaling, I see this body, exhaling, I relax this body. Very nice. I would like to dedicate this time together today to a great teacher that passed away this month, a wisdom teacher by the name of Thich Nhat Hanh, a Vietnamese Buddhist monk. He had some powerful teachings uh, throughout his life. And I want to start with a quote in his own words around the environment. So please take a moment for these words to really go right into the skin and into your body. So these are the words of Thich Nhat Hanh, or Brother Thai. The situation the earth is in today has created an unmindful production and unmindful consumption. We consume to forget our worries and our anxieties. Tranquilizing ourselves with overconsumption is not the way. Fear, separation, hate, and anger come from the wrong view that you and the earth are two separate entities. The earth is only the environment. You are in the center and you want to do something to the earth in order for you to survive. This is a dualistic way of seeing. You carry mother earth within you. She is not outside of you. Mother earth is not just your environment. In that insight of interbeing, it is possible to have real communication with the earth, which is the highest form of prayer. So, uh, I 
know that I'm speaking with a community of people that understand language like this. You have dedicated your career to looking after the environment. From my perspective, I consider you all heroes. You are the guardians of this land and all the creatures, great and small, that inhabit this land. It's a mighty task. And uh, I sense it must feel very overwhelming with the uh, tremendous extinction of species from large mammals to insects that we're seeing right now, to the tremendous changes in climate, the climate change crisis, to the excessive overproduction, overconsumption, overpollution that is just escalating in society. It must feel quite overbearing. In preparing for this talk, I was reminded of a scene from a movie I saw many decades ago. It's the old Superman movie. You know, when Christopher Reeve had a cape around his neck, flying through the skies back in the late 70s. And there, for whatever reason, is Lewis Lane falling down a building. So Superman comes swooping down and catches her just in time and says, don't worry, madam, I've got you. And Lewis Lane looks up at Superman bewildered and says, okay, you've got me, but who's got you? Who's got you? So this brief time together is really to do with who's got you. What is this inner game? What are the mechanics behind it? How do we understand it? And how do we look after it so that we can actually play a better game outside in the outer climate, in the outer environment as well? So I'll take the first little while to set some context around what this inner climate points to. This is teachings from ancient Vedic traditions, very, very old. Of course, it's a very, very quick overview. There's a lot more to it, but a simple way to start is that this inner climate has five components that, uh, that affect the inner climate. The ancient described the first component or the first body as the food body. So the physical body was called the food body, the body made by food. So you were once a tiny baby and look at you now, such tremendous change has taken place. It didn't happen uh, overnight. Constantly, the body is changing through the food we consume. So this is all the physical stuff. All the flesh, the bones, the organs, the tissues, the various systems and cells, liquids and gases, all, the, all that material stuff is the food body. The rest are all invisible. So that's one aspect of your inner climate. The next aspect, more subtle, is the energy inside the body. Now for me to move, of course, I need to have some vitality inside my body. Otherwise I'd be an inanimate object. So there's energy inside this system. We can call it the animating principle. So that's another layer of our inner climate. The third layer, more subtle, is what you can call the mind body. Perhaps you're wondering, what's he talking about? That thought, what's he talking about, just happened in the mind body. It's the place where all ideas, imaginations, hallucinations, projections, all of that stuff hangs out, memories. So that's the mind body. That's also another layer of our inner climate. More subtle than this is what the ancients called the wisdom body. So right now, there are over 50 trillion cells or so that are somehow collaborating and co-creating with such profound intelligence to create this living system. Every cell knows exactly what to do. The eye cell, the knee, the heart, the kidney. This profound organization in the body, the ancients call that wisdom body, wisdom inherited since the dawn of life itself. And the most subtle of all is a body that's just beyond the skin. You can call it the auric body and the body buffer zone or your vibe. There's certain photography called Trillion Photography that can actually capture this. And if I had more time, I could have done an experiment with you to give a very tangible and direct experience of this. Nevertheless, these five things are what comprise of the climate. So my intention now is to go through them layer by layer and just touch upon some aspects on how we may actually understand the mechanics and master these inner climates. Firstly, the physical body. 
this is what I call the five S's of physical fitness. So when the physical body is in good condition, it has these five capabilities, these five S's. The first S is strength. A healthy body can lift reasonably heavy objects. I have a four-year-old at home to be able to lift her up or lift her groceries and so on. This is a healthy body. If someone, something was to happen suddenly, the second S is required, which is speed to be able to run away if something were to happen or run towards. And then the next S is stamina, not just to run, but to have stamina for a meaningful duration, to continue for a meaningful duration of stamina. The next S is skill. Skill would be balance, hand-to-eye coordination, fine motor neuron control like this surfer. And the final S is suppleness. So the dexterity of the body, so the body can move in any direction without feeling stuck. So this essentially is a quick summary of what physical fitness, that food body being fit looks like. So you can ask yourself, you know, where am I strong? Where could I be? Put more attention, for example, perhaps some people are strong, but they have little stamina, or some people have speed, but they have little skill or they're supple, but they don't have any endurance. So these are ways to understand where you can potentially develop the inner climate of physical fitness. Now, before I go any further than this, I want to share with you a very, very important concept, a concept that I call the comfort trap. So the comfort trap is like this. We start with one very simple, basic law of nature, which is, what you practice, you become good at. Now, some of you are scientists and researchers and technicians and so on. You practice this for years, if not decades, and that's why you become good at it. Very recently, our uh, Felix uh, Arger al the wonderful tennis player, won a major tennis tournament. He didn't just show up one morning to win it. He took a lot of practice to get that good. Even an expert musician, you have to practice for years and decades and decades. And as you practice and practice, you become good at it. So that's a basic law of nature. What you practice, you become good at. This law of nature can work for us and can work against us as well. Because it so happens that we are practicing something all the time. Right now, you're holding your body in a particular posture. And you're practicing that. And as you practice that day after day, year after year, decade after decade, you're going to get really good at that and really bad at everything else. So this is an introduction to the concept that I call the comfort trap. It so happens that a lot of us tend to practice sitting like this with our neck and our head and our hands sticking out. There's no wonder we have headaches and migraines and so on and aches in the neck and shoulder. Um, it, uh, the head is like a heavy bowling ball carrying this weight on the neck, the poor neck. So we end up becoming very good at just being like that and very bad at everything else. As you, as John Manuel mentioned, I'm a yoga consultant. And one simple way to understand yoga is that you are essentially moving your body in every conceivable way. So let's start with this idea that you might be familiar with called the comfort zone. Anything inside this blue circle is familiar, it's known. Anything outside this blue circle is unfamiliar, unknown. And the further you go away from the blue circle, the more unfamiliar, unknown it is. Now, just to take this a little bit further, in the center of that comfort zone is your point of maximum indulgence. That is where you're most comfortable. That's your favorite sofa with your favorite snack and your favorite TV show. You have the house to yourself. It's fantastic. And anything away from that center requires more and more effort until you hit that boundary of the comfort zone. On top of this, uh, we realize that it takes effort to get away from the center. And we're also living in a society that seems to prize comfort as the highest virtue of success. So you, you study and do all these things so you can get that big, comfortable house with a big, comfortable car and a big, comfortable so far. Comfort, comfort, comfort. So we tend to gravitate towards the center. And what tends to happen is we tap into that second law of nature, which is use it or lose it. So we end up making that circle smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. 
until we get trapped in our own comfort. This is the comfort trap. Until even that favorite sofa is no longer comfortable because the body is so stuck. So, and when we are stuck like that, what happens is everything outside that small tiny circles becomes unknown, becomes something to fear, something to avoid. So the invitation here, in fact, is not for the circles to become smaller, but what if we actually created an upward spiral where the circle becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So with yoga practice, that's essentially what we're doing. If you can imagine any physical posture, there's a way to get there through yoga practice. So you're moving your body in every conceivable way and you make that circle bigger and bigger to the point when physically speaking, you're comfortable no matter what is happening. You could be in a mud hut in Calcutta, you're comfortable. You could be climbing the Alps, you're comfortable. You could be in a presidential suite, you're comfortable. So no matter what is happening, the body is comfortable. So it's no longer something to be afraid of. So it's no longer something that is debilitating and limiting. And the way we make this circle bigger, remember, we just want to make the circle gradually bigger, gradually, until it's so big, the body is always comfortable. And that's a practice called loving awareness. We get to the boundary of our comfort zone, in whatever posture it might be. And with loving awareness, we invite the boundary to become bigger. And the invitation requires innocence, curiosity, patience, persistence. Innocence, curiosity, patience, persistence. And very soon, your body is completely flexible, comfortable, pain-free, no matter what is happening. So this is a very simple way to understand why the physical movement is so important. The way to look after our physical body is from the food we eat and movement. Enough to say about that. This is something you're already familiar with. Let's go a few levels deeper in this inner climate. So once the aches and pains are, are taken care of, let's look at the next layer, which is the layer of vitality or energy. It's very much like this house that I'm in right now. There's certain energy flowing in the house, which is why the light, computer, electricity, everything is working. There's also certain wiring in this body as well. One simple way to understand it is, you may be familiar with this symbol. It's a very common medical symbol. Very often you see it on ambulances and hospitals and doctors' shirts and so on. Here it is in the cancer society and the nurses' union. Essentially, there are two serpents that go around the staff and then they meet at a certain point and then there's a empty space with wing and a head at the tip of the staff. It so happens that according to ancient sciences, our physical body is wired in a very, very similar way. It sort of looks like this. You have these two serpentine energies that go around the central coil. The two energies are called Ida and Pingala and the central staff is called Shushumna. And the two coils meet at that point between the eyebrows. You'll notice that in the medical sign, there are these seven points, six where the serpents meet and one above the serpent. It's very similar in how our body is wired. Just like this house has three main wires, earth, live, and neutral, our body also has these three main wires. And through this, we energize the rest of the body. There's a lot to be said about this. I literally give like eight week workshops uh, on this theme, but this is just to give you a quick overview that there's actually a vitality in the body and the health of our spine profoundly matters because that's the highway of our energy meridians. Now, I'll stop sharing the screen there. One simple way to understand this is very much like the cell phone. This is literally a smartphone. It's very smart. It's very, very helpful. But if there is no energy in this phone, this phone is useless. It's a, a paperweight at best. It is the energy that gives its usefulness. Our body is built in a very similar way. What do I want from my cell phone? If I have this phone in full brightness with all the apps on, whole bunch of apps that serve no meaningful purpose, working in the background, this phone will be dead by 3 p.m. If I put it on battery saver mode and only use the essential functional apps, then this phone can last for three, four days nonstop. We're doing the same thing with our body. What is it that depletes the vitality in our body? Our vitality is depleted from four main sources. 
the first and most obvious is action. Any kind of action, be it physical, verbal, or mental action, requires energy. For me to work would require energy. For me to speak requires energy. For me to think also requires energy, which is why sometimes you can sit down to work in front of a computer at 8 a.m. and by 5 p.m. you're exhausted. Why? Because thinking requires energy. So these kind of actions depletes our energy. Second thing is tension. To hold tension in our body requires energy. By definition, to hold some tightness requires energy. So if there's any tightness right now in the jaw, the neck, the shoulders, the hips, and so on, the back, serving no meaningful purpose, that's like a leaky tap in your body. That's just dissipating your vitality, which is why doing a morning stretch practice is so, so helpful. You close out all these leaky taps, and you find that you have much more vitality throughout the day. So it takes energy to hold tension. The next one is when we collect data with our sense gates. Right now, my eyes are, color are gathering lights, shapes, and colors. My ears is gathering sound and so on. For me to collect data from the external world through the sense gate, it requires energy. So there's a practice called pratyahara, which means closing down the sense gates. You close down your eyes, you close down your sense gates, so you drop your awareness inside and you conserve the energy and not waste it so much. This is introspection practice. So, uh, so collecting data requires energy. And the fourth one is turbulent emotions. If my body is engaging in a turbulent emotion, that requires a lot of energy. We can see emotion as emotion, energy in motion. For an energy to move through the body, it's consuming a lot of my, my battery supply. So for example, if I'm entertaining rage, the great yoga master Swami Sivananda said, one bout of rage is equivalent to an entire day of physical labor. So not only do you have to bring the rage down, but also bring all the organs that participated in that rage back into homeostasis. It's a huge waste of energy. So that's what we want to do. I want my phone to have a huge capacitor, the ability to store charge really fast, the ability to regulate the charge, no speaks and throws, so nothing glitchy, and, uh, and to close out all the, the sources of energy depletion. And the main way we do that is through breathing practices. There are other ways as well, like sun gazing and diet and barefoot walking and so on, but the primary way is through regulating our breath. The, uh, the breathing techniques called prana yama. Prana is vitality, yama is a regulation and expansion of your vitality. So there's so much to say about this, but I wouldn't want to leave this point without actually sharing a practice with you, a very ancient practice that is very profound and deep reaching. So as an experiment, please join me in this couple of minutes of practice of what's called alternate nostril breathing or anuloma viloma. So take a moment to just give yourself a nice straight spine. This is a practice you can carry with you if you find it to be a benefit. So nice straight spine, chin tucked in slightly. Now we want to support our right elbow with our left palm and then just let the shoulders relax. And the chin is tucked in slightly to release the back of the neck. Let me place the two peace fingers lightly between the eyebrows. Let me demonstrate first, then we can do it together. And then it's alternate nostril breathing. I close my right nostril with thumb. I inhale deeply left. Then I close left, open right. Exhale completely right. And inhale right, close, open left. Exhale completely left side. So let's do this together. Exhaling completely, relax into it. Let the body soften, closing the right nostril. Inhaling deeply left side, all the way up to maximum, nice and smooth. Let me close both sides, open the thumb, exhale right, consciously and completely, all the way down to the very last drop, nice and easy. You inhale right, filling up, all the way up to the brim. Closing both sides, opening left, exhaling consciously and completely, all the way down to the very last drop, left side. Continue at your own speed and range. I'm going to inhale deeply left, 
change sides, exhale completely right, inhale deeply right, continue. You always practice this at the level of sensation. So feel the air entering into the body, feel the air leaving the body. And you want to pick a speed and range that is just right for you. Not too fast, not too slow, just right. As you remember, remember from the image I showed, what we're doing is we're clearing out the two meridians that go around the central staff of the spine, the, the two meridians of Ida and Pingala, of which the Ida lands on the left nostril, which is the cooling meridian, and the Pingala is the right nostril, the warm, the heating meridian. So this practice brings both these energy meridians into homeostasis and creates a very calm, lucid, and focused mind. Let's keep going. So one more round. Finishing off on the left nostril when you're ready. Then dropping the palms down. Take a moment to settle. That was just about two minutes or so. The more you practice, the more exponentially beneficial the effect. So let's continue on to set the context around the inner climate. That's one way to regulate the inner climate. Now we're going to go into something more subtle, which is the mind. Just like there were the five S's for physical fitness, there are also the five C's of mental fitness. When the mind is in optimum condition, it takes on these five characteristics. The first one is C for confidence. This is not just some superficial unworthiness disguised as bravado, but really genuine self-confidence. The next C is compassion. This is deep care for one another. Next C is calmness, a calm abiding presence like the center in the eye of a storm. The next C is concentration, the ability to hold our attention to anything we wish to for a meaningful duration consistently. And the final C is creativity. And here we talk about genuine, authentic creativity, not copy and paste for something in the past, but real, full-on eureka moments. So how do we cultivate a mind that bears such beautiful fruits? Here, I'd like to share with you a concept that I call the mind wheel. So this was my eureka moment. For, for many years, I've been studying teachers, Eastern, Western, ancient, modern, and wondering what are they trying to say? And one day, as clear as day, it came to me as an image of a wheel. So imagine that the mind is a wheel. Some wheels are big, some wheels are small, it doesn't matter, a wheel is a wheel. So for this wheel to have a forward momentum, that's the mind that is remunerating on the future. It is racing after the future. For this wheel, to have a backward momentum, that's a mind that is remunerating about the past. All the coulda, woulda, shouldas. For the wheel to have an upward momentum, that's a wheel in a condition called craving. I want it, I like it, I need it. And for the wheel to have a downward momentum, it's experiencing a condition called aversion. I don't like it, I don't want it. So this is the thing that keeps happening past, future, craving, aversion. And the whole art and science of mental training is to be in the middle of the wheel. So what's the midpoint between past and future? You may say present. The technical term is right awareness. Right awareness means awareness of what's actually happening right now at the level of direct experience. Everything else is just imaginations, memories, hallucinations. Now, the midpoint between craving and aversion, you could call it peace and harmony. The technical term is equanimity. And equanimity means balanced mind. A mind that doesn't get disturbed so easily. Something small happens, gets excited. Something small happens, gets depressed. This is a balanced, this is an unbalanced mind. 
So what we're looking to do is to hang out in the middle of the wheel. That's the sweet spot. That's where all the five C's hang out. Now, not so long ago, I did a, uh, a talk to a group of executives here in Montreal. Uh, it was a massive glass tower of a building. It was on top floor. And there I was with this beautiful mahogany table in front with a group of executives sitting to either side. And I was guiding this eight week program. And the very first session, we just did a 10 minute breath awareness practice. That's it. And after practice, I asked the group, so how is it for you? A little check-in. And I remember this one executive, he responded words to the effect. He said, Askar, I feel so calm, so peaceful, so centered. I've had such a busy, hectic day, so many pressures, so many deadlines, so overwhelming. But in this practice, I felt calm. And you know, I have a country house in Sutton. And when I go to my country house with nature, I also feel calm like this. And my country house, I have not been there for such a long time. It's falling apart. I, I really need to go look after it, but enough to say that I really enjoyed the practice. Thank you. And so I asked this gentleman with a lot of love and, and respect, what are you doing in your country house? And the instructions said nothing about a country house. All I said was observe respiration, but somehow his mind went to a country house. And we all have some version of a country house. So what actually happened from a mechanical perspective is for a brief moment, this man was in the middle of the wheel. And very soon his mind went to a past pleasant memory. Oh, my country house in Sutton also feels so good, so good. And then soon that past pleasant became past unpleasant. Oh, it's falling apart. It's, it's really a big mess. And it goes to future present. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to get the hammer, the nail, the paintbrush and everything. And then it goes to future unpleasant. Ah, it's going to be expensive. I may hurt myself and boom. All of this happens in a matter of moments. I wish I could do an experiment with you to see how this happens, but I'm sure you understand that the mind does wander and being in the middle of the wheel, although it is simple, it is not easy. So everything in that blue area is when the mind is absent. There are all kinds of thoughts that have no relevance to the present moment. There's a nuance here that I want to really pick up on is that in the middle of the wheel, it doesn't mean that there are no thoughts, but rather there are thoughts that are pertaining to the present moment. So for example, a, a very simple way to understand this is taking the example um, that I learned from this wonderful teacher in India called Ramesh Balshekar. This distinguishing distinguish between a working mind and a thinking mind. So imagine that there is a operating theater in a hospital and you're looking at the operating theater and there's a highly skilled brain surgeon doing an operation on a young man. Let's say the surgeon is a she and she's moving with such minute precision. It is so incredible. It is awe inspiring. Tiny, tiny micro movements, scissors, scalpel, microscope, and all the sum total of all her trainings and, and education and previous surgeries and experiences are coming to her spontaneously, simultaneously. And it's a display of spontaneous, effortless excellence. All the thoughts pertaining to that moment are coming spontaneously. This is what's called the working mind. And suddenly, this highly skilled surgeon starts to think to herself this young man. He's the minister's son. She looks out the window. She's the minister, the minister's wife, entourage of reporters looking in. She thinks to herself, oh my goodness, what if I kill this poor fellow? Oh, if I kill this poor fellow, I'll be all over the news. I'd be made a laughing stock of. I may lose my license. Maybe I have to go to a different country, find a different job. My poor husband or wife and kids or whatever, it's gone. Her mind is completely gone. Whole bunch of thoughts that have nothing to do with the present moment. So the center of the wheel offers you what I call right thoughts. And if you're sitting in a formal practice, just observing respiration, nothing to think about, the right thought happens to be no thought. So this is the mental practice. Just like you go to a gym to develop strength and stamina and so on, this mindfulness practice is a way to develop these two qualities of right awareness and equanimity. So no matter what is happening, you're able to stay 
in the middle of that wheel. So now we're going to go a little bit more subtle before we take a little break. And now, as there is a mind wheel, there is an equal emotional wheel. As you can imagine, physiology and psychology are very related, as is the body, so is the mind, mind and body, and so on. So, very simple way to understand this is when that mind is in that top left corner, that is when we're experiencing the emotion that we can call nostalgia, some form of lamenting. Ah, oh, something wonderful happened in the past. She said something wonderful. He said something wonderful like this. So this is past pleasant. Now, this top right corner, that's where emotions pertaining to excitement hangs out. So this is future pleasant. It's important to understand that this is also where addictions hang out. Addictions are actually future pleasant. Take any addiction, gambling, alcohol, cigarette. Well, let's take cigarette, for example. It is not the cigarette itself that is addicted. It is the sensation it creates inside the body that certain people are addicted to. The sensation is like, oh, if I have the cigarette, I'll feel so good. So future pleasant. So there's an addiction to the sensation of craving itself. In fact, a lot of us are addicted to the sensation of craving itself. Now, not just this phone. The latest, the latest iPhone. I want the latest iPhone, see? Future pleasant. When I have that, I'll be so happy. And not just any car, the latest Tesla. When I have the latest Tesla, I'll be so happy. The latest Tesla comes, oh, I need a luxury boat. Not just any luxury boat, the largest luxury boat, the most modern one. We know our dear Jeff Bezos has this big luxury boat stuck in this pier in the uh, Netherlands. They have to destroy um, heritage <laughs> architecture to get the boat out. But this sort of a thing, it's not big enough. It has to be bigger and even bigger. And then you, this actually happened. One of my clients, he happens to be a multimillionaire, perhaps even a billionaire. He was on the runway in his private jet plane. And then he said, I knew something was wrong when, I, when this happened to me. He said, I'm in the jet plane, in the, uh, in the runway, and I see my contemporary in a bigger jet plane in the, in the latest model. I'm thinking to myself, oh, how did he become so rich to afford that? Oh, he bought such and such a company. So I have to buy this company as well. What is wrong with me? <laughs> That's when he realized that he's also addicted to the sensation of craving. It's never enough. You, even to the point, you get a rocket ship, you go to this planet, that planet, this galaxy, that galaxy, and the sky is not the limit. So what's happening here is not really external. It's internal. The cause is internal. There's a sensation of craving that we are addicted to. This is the future pleasant. Now at the bottom left corner, that's where these guys hang out. Past unpleasant. Anger, guilt, shame, resentment, depression, and so on. All these are past unpleasant. In the bottom right corner, we get these emotions. Fear, phobia, anxiety, stress, doubt, and so on. So you see how anything outside the center is creating this turbulence. But in the center of the wheel, that's the emotional state. We can call it love. Not some superficial sentimentality, but the actual visceral sensation of lightness and expansion when you feel incredibly healthy and incredibly calm. And everything in the blue area is more fear-based, more dramatic, because for whatever reason, this present moment is not enough as it is. So this is kind of like how the emotion wheel maps into the mind wheel. I'm going to go a little bit deeper with you in the brief time that we have, even deeper. This may be a bridge too far. Nevertheless, since we're here, let's keep going. What are these emotions and why do they happen? Why does this inner climate get disturbed? So I'd introduced this image to you before. So they meet at these certain points and every, every point where these energy meridians meet, there's a very strong energy vortex. This is a tremendous oversimplification to the point of distortion. There's a lot more to it than just energy. There's information, there's intelligence and so on. But for our purpose, let's just say there are these seven energy vortexes uh, that are called in the ancient terms, 
chakras. You may have heard the word chakras, energy centers. It so happens that these energy centers are also related to very basic need that we all human beings have. This is every single human being, doesn't matter age, gender, culture, religion, ancient, modern, every human being under the skin is wired the exact same way. And what I'll share with you, these basic needs are, you may have heard of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It so happens there's evidence that he was very strongly influenced and inspired by uh, Sri Aurobindo and these ancient Vedic contact, contact, concepts. Nevertheless, it's important to realize that we're all built the same way. When these energy centers are in homeostasis, we're all delightful human beings, peaceful, calm, loving, genius. When they get disturbed, that's when we start to act in tragic ways. So a quick overview, the, at the very base, we have our need for safety. Safety is the earth element, and uh, this covers a lot of ground. Safety, of course, the roof over my head and so on, but also safety in my career, my relationship, in the country I'm choosing to live in. And more subtle than this, I'm going to go through this quite fast. We have the need, the water element, which is the movement. When water becomes stale and stagnant, it becomes putrid. So we all have this need for freedom. Nobody wants to feel stuck. And then more subtle, we have a, a need to feel recognized, validated. This is the fire element. Like my, my four-year-old daughter comes to me and says, Papa, look at this robot. And I say, oh, my darling, what a remarkable robot. Never seen something like it. It's so magnificent. She feels so happy because her need for validation and appreciation was met. More subtle than this, we have the, the heart area, which is our need for connection. You can call it love as an interdependent being. We all wish to feel a sense of belonging, feel a sense of connection, feeling heard, listened to, shared, and so on. We're social beings after all. So there's that need for connection. And then more subtle in the throat, we have this need for purpose. Uh, there's a lot to say about this, but enough to say for now that we all have such unique gifts, talents, attributes, and acts, and so on. And it feels so fulfilling, fulfilling to express this in a way that benefits society. Another way to understand it is nobody wants to feel useless. And more subtle than this is something more sacred, space between the eyebrows, our need to connect with something beyond this mind-body mechanical system. You can call it a non-localized intelligence. You can call it God, grace, divine. All sacred practices and religions are based on this. And the seventh one is transpersonal. It's beyond words. Words can't even touch it. Uh, enough to say that when the lower six are well aligned and in good, healthy, uh, optimum state, the seventh one takes care of itself. And this is going from gross to subtle. And it so happens that most of us are really actually stuck at the bottom three, the most gross vibrations. I made that number up, 87.536. But a lot of us, when our need for safety is not met, we feel fear. When our need for freedom is not met, we feel frustration. When our need for validation is not met, we feel resentful. When our need for connection is not met, we feel depression. When our need for uh, uh, self-expression is not met, we feel hollow and unfulfilled, and so on. So this architecture is important to understand. What's most important to understand is that the laws of nature are such that we are perfectly capable of meeting our own needs. We're perfectly capable of actually fulfilling all these energy centers so that life becomes an expression of this fulfillment, of this joy and of this happiness, not a seeking of it. So the practice on how we can meet our own needs so that our inner climate is so well looked after whatever comes from that is bound to have a positive impact on the external climate. And the practice has everything to do with loving awareness. That's the practice. The practice is a deep dive into the experience of loving awareness. So let me land by first sharing this practice with you of loving awareness and how you can bring this into your life as well so that your inner climate is an optimum condition. And it's really a physical, visceral, tangible practice. I would say this practice is as important as the importance that you give it. So for five minutes or so, please take a moment to just really settle in, let your feet rest on the ground, let your body become soft around the bones, like clothes resting on a hanger. 
Just feel the breath moving inside your nose. As if you're noticing the touch of the breath inside your nose for the very first time today. This sensation that has been there all along, coming alive with that light of awareness. Loving awareness. And we follow the next in-breath into the body and with the exhalation, dropping the awareness inside the body. Feels good to do so. You may close the eyes to get a good feel of the physical body. All the flesh, the bones, the organs and tissues. Loving awareness of the physical structure. Loving awareness of all the vitality that is permeating throughout the body. This entire body is glowing with energy, the animating principle, loving awareness of even this. Loving awareness of the mind. There may be the thought, I understand, or I don't understand, or some other thought, perhaps an absence of thoughts. Loving awareness of the emptiness of thoughts. Loving awareness of this body's profound intelligence. Every single cell right now knows exactly what to do. Collaborating, co-creating with such profound intelligence manifest this entire living system. That intelligence, balancing hormones, pH, body temperature, so much more right now. Loving awareness, the space just beyond the skin, like a halo emanating from the body. Loving awareness means everything that falls in awareness is love. This includes any aches and pains, including any dark thoughts, any heavy or tight emotions, everything in the awareness is love. And everything that is loved feels cared for. And everything that feels cared for thrives. So may this loving awareness practice directly or indirectly benefit all living beings. And may peace prevail on this beautiful earth. Feels right, gently, Deepening the breath and opening the eyes with the in-breath. Thank you for your beautiful practice. Thank you, Environment Climate Change Canada, for looking after us so well.
Merci beaucoup à Bascar. Thank you very much, Bascar. It was absolutely fantastic having listened to you for the past 45 minutes. So there are questions in the chat for Bascar. We have a few minutes left, and if you have the time, you can stay with us past two o'clock. And uh, the first one is, I feel like it's impossible for me to focus on these things because of my high workload. Mm. How can I integrate wellness when I have very little time? This goes back to that original story of Superman, you know, who's got you? We can only continue like this for so long. There's a beautiful anecdote by the wonderful teacher who also passed away, Dr. Wayne Dyer. He said that when you squeeze an orange juice, what are you going to get? Are you going to get grape juice, mango juice? No, you can only get orange juice. Same with us human beings. When we get squeezed, only what's inside us is going to come out. If inside us we have anger, frustration, depression, anxiety, and so on, that's what's going to come out. So what good am I to my family, to my friends, to my colleagues, to my society, when all I'm producing is more toxins and more negativity? So in 24 hours in our day, it is so important to just take maybe even 10 minutes to practice this breathing technique that I described, to practice this loving awareness, so that your own bank account is full, your bank account of patience, self-acceptance, self-love, compassion. So when we go out into the world, good things come out when we get squeezed. And it's never been more important for good things to come out when we are squeezed. So it is actually the very reason to practice that you're so busy, that you have so much going on, that so many things depend on you. And you called us uh, the guardians of the land earlier. And um, we have a lot of very hardworking people. And today we were fortunate. We had over a thousand people tuning in to listen to you. And uh, we have another question for you. Um, how do we help balance our inner climate if there are factors affecting several of the chakras that are out of control? This is a very important thing to understand. I wish I could go deeper with you on this. You have full say over what happens inside your body. Outside the skin, anything can happen. We don't know, as we already saw. But inside the skin, you should have some say over this. And these ancient practices are to do with what's inside the skin. See, outside the skin, the world has changed so much. But inside the skin, hardly anything has changed. So certain movement practices, certain breath practices, certain mindfulness practices are so powerful to feed your own energy centers, to bring them into a sense of homeostasis. We have this capacity to self-regulate our inner climate. It's a practice, it's a training, and it's well worth it. In fact, it's the most important thing we can do, not just for ourselves, but for all the generations to follow. See, the root cause of what's creating all the external damage is not regulations and policies. This is important, but it's really to do with our unchecked cravings and aversions and, and distractions and numbing and so on. To live an examined life has become so important. That sense of more conscious living of why do I want this? Oh, I have a need for appreciation. This is a very simple equation, which maybe I can just make this very important point. It's a very simple equation and it's true for every human being. Behind every unwholesome action, be it physical or verbal, there is an unpleasant feeling. And behind every unpleasant feeling, there is an unmet need. Opposite is also true. Behind every wholesome action, physical or verbal, there is a pleasant feeling. And behind every pleasant feeling, there are one or more needs met, just like my daughter's need of being validated was met. And we can meet our own needs. And once we do that, we can see when animosity comes, oh, this person's behaving badly. Okay, they probably are feeling this way. And they're feeling this way because they have this need, a need to feel safe, a need to feel free. And it's beautiful. All these needs are so beautiful. It's a pleasure and a privilege to help people meet their needs. It's just we go about expressing our needs in very tragic ways. And there's a skillfulness to this. 
Well, comme vous avez dit, euh, on devient bon à ce qu'on pratique. Hein? So we get uh, what we practice, we become good at. Uh, we have someone asking, I have ADHD. I feel like my mind is always running. Do you have any suggestions on how to make my mind rest? And there's a second question asking, when is the best time to do breathing practice? Mm. I would say for the ADHD, focus on moving the body. Move the body. Any agitation in the body shows up as agitation in the mind. So psychology, physiology are related. So whatever movement practice you really enjoy, be it dance or hiking or yoga or fitness or whatever it might be, move your body, get all that, that erratic energy released from your body. So I would recommend uh, movement a lot, you know, and, uh, and of course, for a mind that wanders so much, a simple breath awareness practice can help a lot. Just observing breath coming in, going out just for two minutes a day or so, you'll find the mind starts to settle because the playing fields of future and past are gone. That's the thing about breath awareness. You can only breathe here and now. You can't breathe yesterday or tomorrow. So all the ADHD of past, future, they disappear just simply because your mind is resting in the present moment. The second question, when's the best time to practice? It would be the morning time, mainly because you don't know what happens in your day. All kinds of fiascos can happen in a day. But for most of us, we know what happens in the morning. So if you can just wake up 10 minutes early, you brought yourself 10 precious minutes. So in those 10 precious minutes, if you just do this alternate nostril breathing practice, breath awareness practice, five minutes, five minutes, you have invested beautifully in your day. So the rest of the day, you are, you're benefiting from the practice. That's the best time. The second best time, of course, is at, at dusk before you go to bed. So when you do these practices before going to bed, certain practices, you're going to have very nice deep sleep. So you wake up feeling rested and recharged. These are the two best times. I think we have a lot of people still online. So we'll, we'll go maybe for one or two more questions uh, and not indulge too much on your, uh, on your time, Pascal. But um, how do you teach loving awareness to children? Any tips as a father yourself? As a father of three children, I have learned something very humbling that children do not learn from what I say, they learn from who I am. And uh, it's a tough lesson, but nevertheless, it's undiplomatic, humbling, and also um, very inspiring. So if I tell children loving awareness and I have no loving awareness, this has no effect at all. The first has to be with myself. So the first thing, just like in an airplane, you put your own oxygen mask on before you put the child's mask on. So I would sincerely commit to a practice of loving awareness every morning, just giving yourself, just like we just did, loving awareness of body, loving awareness of mind, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and then the children, when ch I don't know how old the children are, but children are, are born really great. There's no issues there. It's when we start to project our fears and anxieties and insecurities and angers and frustrations, that's when they start developing nasty habits. So step one is to, is to, as Gandhi would say, be the change you wish to have in your children. Um, the second thing is with our family, we have a routine. We have a, almost like a, like a ritual, ritualizing the morning. So we get together and have a little breath practice before we eat. Very simple, just three deep breaths, inhaling. I, I see my body exhaling, I relax my body. Something as simple as that. My children are 15, 12, and 4, so it's good for all age groups. Just three deep breaths before you start is a good place to start. You'll find there's more richness in presence, better digestion. Um, so that would be some simple ways to start with children. The number one is definitely uh, they will mimic our behavior, so our behavior matters most. Um, I will ask two more questions. Um, does the comfort trap apply to other bodies too, in addition to the physical body? And personally, I was wondering, we're often in a, a mode where we're, we've had pressure to perform. Is it possible that our comfort zone is in, in that stressful portion sometimes of performance? Mm -hmm. Yes, this model of the comfort zone applies for many things. It also applies to uh, society. If you spend all your time with people who look the same, who, who think the same, behave the same, do the same thing, these kind of people become comfortable. 
everything else becomes uncomfortable. So you see, this model covers a lot of ground. And yes, if you are living in a hyper-stressed uh, environment all the time, your body is only familiar with that. It's comfortable with being stressed. It doesn't know how to not be stressed. Um, but the research has shown that prolonged stress is very counterproductive. So, for example, when a gazelle is being chased by a lion, okay, the mind is very sharp, making quick decisions. If that goes on for a very long time, the movement of the gazelle becomes very predictable. And the gazelle is running, but not really running. It's what's called in the workplace presentism. You know, you're there, but not really there, or, or which soon leads to burnout. So uh, it is not the, the way for long-term sustained career. Uh, you have to see yourself as a as a professional instrument and for you to function properly as a professional you need this mind body to be in that state of relaxed awareness not tight because when you're tight as i mentioned you just get exhausted for no reason whatsoever you're holding tension that serves no meaningful purpose um so it'll it'll make you even better when i see pro athletes and i work with pro athletes the ones who are tense they can be even better you know, when you see real mastery there's an effortless excellence to it like a Roger Federer or something like that, or an Itzhak Perlman, you know, they make it look easy. And if somebody is really great and they're still tense, they can be even better. Uh, we'll take this last question and then uh, we'll uh, move on to the final comments, I guess. So last one for you, Pascal, today. How can we advocate for wellness and a wise approach in the workplace? I mean, we're, we're thankful to have you here today. What else can we do to try to advocate for this in the workplace? There is no shortcut to practice. I know in this one hour that we've had together, perhaps I've served to inform and inspire you, and that's helpful, it's good. Maybe I've shown you some ideas and insights, but nothing much has really happened. The real benefit can only happen if we practice. There is no shortcut to it. So having a culture of wellness practice, to me, is not a recommendation. It's the only way. It is embodying these values as a culture from an actual practice. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy, whatever it is. Uh, having a space available where people can meditate or, or allowing for time when people can go for nature walks and valuing that and creating a culture around that. Um, so it has everything to do with embodied culture. So this has to go beyond inspiration, philosophy, sentimentality, and actually be something that is an embodied living reality. And Environment Canada is like the best place for us. You guys are already nature lovers. You're already tuned in to the, all the tremendous health and abundance of nature. So uh, it's a very low hanging fruit to create that culture. Well, uh, we already went a little bit overboard on the Depassing Spiltan aujourd'hui. We went a bit over today. Goswami for the incredible session today. Also, a big thank you to the tech support team as well as the interpreters. And we mustn't forget Karin and Dave. Thank you for putting this event together for all of us. Last but not least, we thank all of you for attending today. I hope you all have a great afternoon and do stay tuned for future events through ECCC News. And the material and uh, more uh, information and advice will be coming based on today's session. Thank you, Pascal.